I'm going to teach you the geology of gold, a beginner's guide. And I'm going to go over the 10 basic models that you should know when you're out looking for gold in the field. That way you can go out and find your own low deposits. Now while I'm talking geology, I'm going to be laying in another section of rail. Because every time we advance five feet here in the drift, we always lay down a new section of rail. So that way we can get our ore car back here and get all this waste material out quickly so we can get to the gold faster. Now most of the gold that's mined today formed through a process of one of these deposition models. Now there are subcategories categories to these 10, but these are the 10 basic models. And the reason why you should know this is because when you're in the field and you start recognizing patterns, it'll lead you on to maybe an untapped source of gold that's nearby. Very important that you understand the three different rock types. You got metamorphic, igneous, and sedimentary. You're going to see a lot of that in the USGS reports. And it's very important you understand what their relationship is with gold deposition models it's because each area is going to have a different deposition model and you need to understand why. And the why is gonna lead you to finding more deposits that have been missed in the past. Now the first one on the list is epithermal system. And of course this is one of my favorite because living here in Nevada, that's what we have the most of. And they can be extremely rich, what's classified as a bonanza type deposit. And the reason why they're so common here in Nevada, because the state has been slowly pulled apart so the crust is very thin. Now the epithermal systems can be broken down into two subcategories, high sulfidation and low sulfidation. Trust me, when you're out prospecting, you want low sulfidation. These are what usually form around hot springs. The water has a very low pH balance. It's very clear and it looks like you could drink it, but I wouldn't. And keep in mind, epithermal means shallow, so it's a shallow system. Now, on the other hand, you have high sulfidation, like your alunite, and you can always tell these systems because you have a lot of leaching going on. And that's what high sulfidation systems do, is they literally leach the rock. High sulfidation systems that are very acidic they come rushing up they literally start dissolving the rock and they start pitting it and they only leave silica behind so most of your feldspars are going to be leached out in the form of clays so when you look at the rock it's going to be pitted so when you're in the field and you see this pitting in the rock that looks like it's been eaten by acid that's what has happened oh, i got my sleepers in not bad huh and i got my track in all I gotta do now is level it. Now when I say leveling it, I mean that I'm gonna put a 3% grade on that track headed back to the haulage shaft. The reason why, like in most mines, is that you want that track to slowly go downhill back to wherever it is you're gonna be dumping that waste rock. The reason why is because when it's full, it's a lot easier just to let it roll on its own weight, its old forward inertia, than it is to try to push it uphill. So that's why all mines, including this one, has got a slight grade to the track leading back to where the haulage shaft is. Are you guys still with me out there, huh? I know a lot of this stuff can get a little dry and boring sometimes, but this is information you need to know. But if you'd rather read about it in a condensed form, me and Slim wrote a book, Where to Find Gold by Jeff and Slim. Everything I'm covering today is inside of this book and more. And it's got really easy to understand graphics. That way when you guys look at it, you'll see the cartoons we've written, you'll understand a lot easier. So if you get a chance, get this book. All right, let's get our rail in these fish plates make sure your fish plates are tight and make sure your nuts are on the outside <laughs> all right the next one is what well if we're talking epithermal the next one in line is going to be mesothermal or orogenic hosted gold deposits these are the ones you're going to see mostly out in california these are typically created by mountain building events and you can tell that when you're working around the Sierras, how the mountains have been thrusted up. Now, a lot of your quartz veins are running near vertical because of this. And you have a lot of mineralization and gold deposition because of it. A lot of minerals are squeezed out of these rocks. Now, a sub-process of that is called regional metamorphism. Remember I told you there's three types of rocks, sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic. So a lot of your gold deposits in California, low gold, is gonna be because of orogenic or mesothermal, which is deep vein system. Now in another video, I'll cover some of the different host rocks, the gang material and mineral assemblages that are associated with gold in the different gold districts. But for right now, we're just gonna keep it basic with the 10 basic deposition models. Gotta use a track gauge when you're installing track. That's what this thing is for. Number three on the list is intrusion-related deposits and falling lights. 
Intrusion related deposits can be extremely rich. We've even made videos on them. One of them was called Rich Gold and Red Dirt. We filmed that out in Good Springs over at a mine not far from town. Now the interesting characteristics about this is where the granite comes in contact with the limestone, you get a process called metasomatism and you can get some really rich secondary enrichments there, scarns, incredibly rich and it's native gold. And like I said, we made videos about this. Now these deposits can be fairly easy to spot. You're going to look for decomposing granite or granitic rock that's sitting right up against some type of a limestone, usually gray limestone. And in between, you're going to see this beautiful red limonite that's in the middle. That's what's going to be carrying all your gold. I made a special video about it called rich gold and red dirt. So I'll leave a link down below so you can see what that looks like. You're gonna see all these different types of bog iron that's associated with it too. And it's gonna be crystalline gold that comes out of there. No quartz, it's all gonna be in the limonite. Now in your USGS reports, that type of granitic rock is gonna be referred to as granitic porphyry. And when they say porphyry, they just means that it's a very soft altered type of granitic rock. Now the next one is called a Carlin trend type of deposit. Now I don't recommend this type of deposit of all you small scale miners out there because it's not worth it. And that's why that particular deposit hadn't been touched until just recently. Now one of the reasons why you've heard that the Carlin trend is one of the world's leading gold producers is because it's classified as a high tonnage, low grade mine, which means that companies like Barrick and Newmont, they can pull out tons and tons per day and make profit, even if it's only a couple grams per ton. And that's what this mine is producing. It's not worth it to the small scaler like you and I. All right, are you still with me? All right, next one is volcanic mass sulfides. Now, as the name implies, there's a lot of sulfides in there, and this is often referred to as refractory ore. So when you see that in your USGS report, try to stay away from those because you have to roast them. The next one, iron oxide copper gold deposits. These are one of my favorites, and you're going to find a lot of these in Arizona. Arizona is known for its copper. It's also known for its gold. There's a trend that runs from the northwest section of the state down to the southeast section of the state. A lot of copper and gold. They're intertwined. So when you start finding copper deposits down there, also look for gold associated with it. You're going to see a lot of iron, copper, and gold all in the mix. That's why they call it iron oxide copper gold deposit. Now the iron is going to be oxidized like the name implies. You're also going to find a lot of Gaussians down there too. Look that up because those are extremely rich as Henry Wickenberg found out. Next one is porphyry deposits. You're going to see these a lot in your USGS reports. Now, most of the time, porphyry deposits refer to copper deposits. So when you see that, usually gold's going to be a secondary mineral in that assemblage. Not bad. I got my sleepers in or my ties. Everything's straight. All I got to do now is backfill and we're good to go for another five feet. All right, the next one is tellurides. Now you have two different tellurides that are very, very economical to find in mine, and that would be calvarite and sylvanite. And believe it or not, you can find a lot of these in Colorado, especially in a little place called what? Yeah, that's right, tellurite. Now tellurite is a type of sulfide, but what you're gonna have to do to get the gold out is roast it like you would any other sulfide. And the richest ones that we've seen is calvarite. Next one is fissure filling systems, or as most of you know, quartz vein system. Now I was reluctant to put this in a category because quartz vein systems, fissure filling systems, can also be included in some of the other deposition models that I talked about earlier. But for the sake of conversation, we're gonna cover it. For the most of you out there that don't know, the way that these fissure filling systems work is that there's a natural natural void in the earth, usually caused by faulting, fracturing, and hydrothermal fluids find their way into these faults. There's a number of systems in place that can cause these hydrothermal fluids to come up. Now, they're not always going to have mineral assemblages with them. And the first episode may not have minerals in it, but the third, fourth, or fifth that are carrying mineralization in it. And that's why you can see a lot of this banding, kind of like chalcedony. You have all the banding. Well, it's the same thing. And it's another reason why they call it ribbon quartz, because you have a lot of episodes of silica hydrothermal solutions depositing around the original one. And then you can also get what's called fault valving, where it's literally spreading that fault apart each time you have another series of hydrothermal fluids rush up through there. The gold is usually traveling in ionic form, and you have four different factors involved that's going to cause deposition to occur of these mineral assemblages. Either pH balances have changed, you're going to have boiling pressure decreases, and you're going to have temperature decreases. And there's a lot of factors involved that cause cause those things to happen. Now I know you're thinking, Jeff, that's only nine. Where's the 10th one? All right, you got me. I see you're paying attention. 
All right, number 10, greenstone hosted deposits, which also can encompass shear zone. Now, a lot of your greenstone deposits are gonna be up north around Canada. It's sometimes referred to as the Canadian Archaean Greenstone Belt. These deposits can be very rich as well, and they're hosted in granitic rock, very, very old granitic rock. The gold is gonna form at the contact zones, okay? A lot of geologists have been scratching their heads about this, but it's always gonna be at the contact zone. All right, enough jaw jacking, let's get that ore car on there. Take it. Nice. Now I've had a few of you ask, Jeff, what type of rock have you found most of your gold in? Well, in where I live, most of it has been igneous rock. And the reason that is, is because of the location in which we do a lot of our prospecting, which is in Nevada. But if you're in California, of course, you'd say metamorphic rock. Now I'd like to know, what type of rock did you find most of your gold in? Was it metamorphic? Was it igneous? Or was it sedimentary? Go ahead and leave me a comment down below because I'd love to hear your story. And if you really want to get good at it, go ahead and get our book, Where to Find Gold by Jeff and Slim. It has everything we talked about in there and so much more in graphic detail and cartoons. So I'm going to get on out of here. And if you like today's video, well, you know what to do. Come on, Sonny Jim. How many times have I said it? And we hope everybody out there had a very Merry Christmas and we're wishing each and every one of you a very golden new year. So be safe out there. Let us know your story and we'll see you on the next video. So until next time, this is Jeff Williams and who? My name is Jeff. Saying you want to find the mother load so you can strike it rich? You better learn that geology, son, because the first thing to do is your research. Take care, everybody.